YouTube is a pretty vicious place. Many violent and dreadful things are put up on YouTube for the whole world to watch. But there's a particular YouTube channel with a few million subscribers. All of its videos are of people being hurt and beaten, and some are even eaten alive by predatorial animals and cannibals. It's disgusting. How and why does this YouTuber record these events instead of helping the people in danger? How does he find people in these deadly situations over and over again? And how does YouTube never manage to remove his videos? These questions have been circling in my mind ever since he touched my life. I must admit that I have watched many of his videos, but I'm sure that some people have tried to charge him. He's clearly sadistic, but I would think that anyone would feel ashamed to gain so happily from other people's suffering. The weirdest part, though, is that some of the people he records survive through their trauma, and they end up in another video of his. If they continue to survive, then they get to be in more of his videos. So, some people think they're all actors and everything is planned. To me though, something just doesn't sit right. Especially considering what happened to me a couple of months ago. I live alone. I was in my garage by myself and something heavy dropped on my head. I was out for a couple of minutes. I went to the hospital and everything was fine. But when I went on YouTube the next day, there was a YouTube video with many views that featured me getting hit in the head by a hammer in my garage. Nobody was in the garage to record me, and I don't have any cameras in the house. It's not something I would ever want on YouTube. It was that guy though. The one who puts up these videos. How the hell did he find me? Eventually. I encountered more and more dangerous accidents, but I was always lucky enough to survive. With every situation, there's a new YouTube video of me in that same experience, and I just know it's the same guy recording me. I've never seen him in my life, only his gruesome videos. And I've tried contacting him and telling him that no matter how he managed to record me, he could suffer consequences. On multiple occasions, I threatened to contact the police and take him to court. He never replied, but I decided to get in touch with another victim, Joel, whom this guy has recorded many times. In Joel's workplace, he became the company's laughing stock on account of all the ridiculous videos of him on YouTube. Joel told me that he doesn't know how the guy has managed to record him so many times, and that he was always sure he was alone during all his accidents. Joel has been dealing with this for about a year, and he told me that he had never been a clumsy person before all this happened. It's some sort of curse. When someone's chosen, their misfortunes come at the expense of this YouTuber forever. Then one day, the worst happened. It was another video of Joel. He had gotten into a car accident involving smoke, broken glass, and explosions. It was so horrific that I can't go into detail. After that, I became afraid every day of what would happen to me. Eventually, I saw him in my house. I slipped on water on my kitchen floor, and when I looked up, he was standing there with his camera, smiling at me. I shouted at him to get out and to stop tormenting me. He ran upstairs, but after checking every room, he had disappeared. You guessed it though, I saw that video of me slipping on YouTube the very next day. To this day, I'm deeply fearful. He is always watching and always recording. I don't know what to do. If he chooses you, then you're it, and you have to live with his presence floating about you constantly. My accidents are getting worse and worse. Day by day, my life becomes more endangered. I don't know how to fix this. 
but I'm writing this as a warning to all of you. Beware of the cameraman. If you ever see a video of someone getting hurt, you can be certain that it's because of him. You just can't be certain that you won't be next. The shovel stopped mid-dig, a metallic thunk announcing that it had struck something other than dirt. Ramona jabbed into the soil again, curious about what was buried in her newly bought backyard. Her brow crinkled in annoyance at how poorly her plan to plant a wisteria tree was going, but the prospect of buried treasure quickly ignited a childlike excitement in her. She had bought the countryside house in Waitsfield, Vermont, at a highly discounted price one that her real estate agent Dave frequently joked was almost too good to be true. This house is simply to die for, and the price guarantees that you won't be crushed by debt. He had promised to be close by if she needed anything, and told her that if she ever wanted someone to show her around the area, she could give him a call. Dave had been flirting unashamedly with her since he had shown her around the property the week before, so Ramona has been glad to sign the paperwork and escape from his cramped, dingy office. While she was there, he hadn't mentioned the previous owners burying a time capsule or anything of the sort, so this was probably a forgotten child's toy or a long-lost metal lunchbox. A few minutes worth of rapid digging passed, and more and more metal was revealed. Three hours later, Ramona stood, filthy and panting, in front of a once-buried door that led further down into the depths of her backyard. She had expected a palm-sized object to be unearthed, not something that belongs on the side of a house. The dirt street, iron door was chained closed, with bolts and padlocks festooning it. As she was staring at it, she could swear that she heard something move behind it, and an almost inaudible scraping sound reached her ears. Ramona shook her head, easily convincing herself that she was just exhausted, and that it must be dirt sliding around on the other side of the door from her disturbing the soil. The amount of rust on the chains showed that it had been closed for a long time, and when she tugged at one of the padlocks, it stayed firmly in place. She would ask Dave about it in the morning. At that moment, her growling stomach loudly demanded attention, so she figured that the mystery of the door could hold off until tomorrow. A phone call in a hot shower later found Ramona on the couch, a box of delivery pizza in hand. Uh, no one be more about gel coat. She clicked around Netflix, finally ending up in the horror section. What should we watch, Frankie boy? Her black lab Frank wagged his tail at her, clearly only interested in getting pizza. She tossed him one, laughing as her greedy mutt expertly caught the slice by the crust. He wolfed it down, barking happily in thanks. Ramona flicked past Let Me In, King Kong, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Friday the 13th before settling on The Mummy. She hadn't seen the newest one yet and the way the strange door in her backyard reminded her of a tomb had her in the mood for something scary. Ramona and Frank finished the movie, and as she headed to bed, she found herself feeling a little nervous at her first night alone in the Vermont countryside. She had grown up in Philadelphia, so being able to see trees outside of her window was a novelty. The house was also full of odd creeks, which Dave had assured her was just the house settling. The wind was knocking a few of the old-fashioned shutters against the side of the house, so she made sure to latch them in place before going to bed. There was no use in scaring herself silly over a window. Around 4 a.m., a deep growl woke her, and she took a moment to process what was happening. Frank was out of the bed, something her lazy mutt hated doing at night, and he was staring at the far window. Ramona could tell that it was the one overlooking the backyard and the sight of her normally placid dog's raised hackles was a bit disturbing. Frank, come. When he ignored her, Ramona got out of bed, her slipperless feet wincing away from the cold hardwood floor. She grit her teeth and made her way to the dog, gently tugging at his collar to get his attention. In the moonlight, she saw his eyes shift over to her, but he wouldn't budge. He was clearly guarding the bed and wasn't about to leave his post. Damn it, Frankie. Get in the bed. No response. Not even a tail wag. Ramona let go of his collar, making her way gingerly over to the window closest to her bed. 
She was sure that all he was freaking out about was something new to him, like a deer or maybe a coyote. Just to be safe, she pressed her hand to the glass and peered around the yard, her eyes straining to make anything out in the darkness of the cloudy country night. She checked the first two windows, each with the same result. There was nothing moving out there, not even so much as a leaf blowing across the grass outside. She let out a frustrated sigh, her annoyance level spiking with each window that proved that there wasn't anything her dog should be upset over. By then her feet were freezing, and getting in bed was more tempting than checking the last of the four windows. The moment she turned to go back to bed was when the harsh ringing sound of heavy chains heaping together caused her to jump and shriek. Ramona ran to the final window, her eyes growing wide at the sight of the now open doorway. This was when Frank decided to run out of the room howling, his paws skidding on the wooden floor as he pelted down the stairs and out the doggy door. Ramona ran after him, barely stopping long enough to grab a flashlight out of a kitchen drawer. She threw open her front door, darting into the yard after her best friend. Her shrill pleas for Frank to come back went unheeded, and just as she rounded the corner of the house closest to the buried door, she saw something move in it, then disappear. She skidded to a halt at the maw of the door, her hands shaking so badly that the flashlight beam was bouncing. Ramona could hear Frank moving further and further away, and in a moment the sound was smothered by the musty air wafting out of the doorway. All she wanted to do was call the police, but she didn't want to get in trouble for wasting their time. Plus, with how far out in the country she lived, Frank could have gotten hurt by the time they would make it there. She would just have to rescue him herself. As she stood there debating, her knees trembling in terror, she heard her dog's quiet whimper. Frank! Her cry was swallowed by the darkness, and all that followed was silence. That was the first time she noticed the deep furrows on the inner side of the door. There were large, thick gouges in the iron, something which no animal could have done. They were long and unbroken crossing from the upper right corner to the bottom left side as though angrily swiped onto the door. Ramona was shaken out of her observance by another whimper, this one sounding even more shrill and panicked. That was it. She knew she couldn't just stand there while Frank was in trouble, so she repressed her fear of the unknown and passed through the doorway. The first step was hardly illuminated by the flashlight, and staring ahead was like looking down a bottomless well. For just a moment, she thought she saw the glint of eyes in the darkness, but they were gone before she could see more. The railless steps wound downwards in a spiral, and it took all of Ramona's concentration to not fall. The stairs were spotted with slick, dark patches of liquid, and once she realized it was blood, she broke down sobbing. Something had gotten Frank, but she still had to know what happened. As she reached the bottom of the staircase, she found a pile of eviscerated rats, their mutilated corpses strewn about the narrow hallway. Her relief that it wasn't Frank's blood was quickly replaced with horror as the dead bodies trailed off into the darkness, the decapitated heads of the rodents spaced like macabre paving stones. Ramona resisted the urge to vomit at both the grisly sight and the noxious stench as she made her way down the rock wall corridor. She was careful not to step on any of the poor creatures. The corridor, barely lit in the weak beam of her flashlight, was just damp, solid rock wall. The floor was some sort of semi-rotted wood, and it looked like it could have once been an old root cellar. At the end of the hallway lay a second metal door, but this one had been smashed through. It was ripped off of its hinges, and had several more gouges along its surface. Frank? She hadn't heard any noise except for her own footsteps, but fear was nearly winning the battle for Ramona's fight-or-flight response. The entire situation was surreal, and she just wanted to get frank and pretend the whole creepy experience had never happened. As she stepped gingerly around the last rat carcass, something caught her eye in the next room, her flashlight barely causing it to glint. For a hopeful heartbeat, she thought it might have been from Frank's collar, but as she passed through the second doorway, Ramona saw that the beam was reflecting off of a massive golden statue. The ceiling-tall cobra was melded around a hieroglyph-covered pillar, layers of sand blanketing the base of the serpent. For a moment, 
Ramona wondered if she was even in Pennsylvania any longer, or if this was some sort of an outlandish nightmare. The statue had two arms with long, dagger-like claws protruding from each scaled limb, and it had an almost human-like intelligence emblazoned on its face. While fascinating, it wasn't her dog. She began scanning the room for any signs of Frank, but there was nothing other than more sand. She was sure that there hadn't been any other hallways branching off, and she didn't remember seeing any other doors. After the stairs, it had been a straight shot to the snake room, and there hadn't been anywhere for a 60-pound lab to hide. Ramona was becoming frantic, her chest constricting as her panic built. The thought that monsters existed was almost too much to process. There had to be a rational explanation for everything that had happened, and she was probably becoming terrified over nothing. Even as Ramona tried to shake the cloying dark thoughts from her head, they crept right back in. Something had taken the chains off of the outer door. Something had very recently decapitated a bunch of rats. Something was strong enough to leave marks in a reinforced iron door. And something must have her dog. She had to find him. Frank, come here, boy. Now. Where's my good boy? Frank? Silence was all that answered her call. Tears began rolling down her cheeks and Ramona held back a sob. The sound of slow applause made her scream. Her flashlight beam illuminating Dave's face when she whirled around. Her real estate agent lounged casually against the doorway, a smirk plastered on his face. Well, congratulations, Miss Gabbery. You've made it further than any of the others. My demon must really like you if you didn't immediately end up like the rats, since he has a tendency to play with his food before eating it. He? he? Oh yes, let me introduce you to my pet. His name is Naja, and he's about a thousand years old, hence his horrendously outdated taste and decor. Why do you have a demon? Uh, how do you have a demon? This is crazy. Ramona stopped mid-sentence as the sand at the base of the effigy began to undulate, the ripples spreading outwards until the statue's tail was slithering across the ground. The beast began unwinding itself from the pillar, and where Ramona expected a metallic grating noise, there was only the soft shifting of the sand. She turned her attention to Dave, tensing her body to sprint past him. Just as she was about to dart forward, the creature's tail lashed out, knocking her off of her feet. Before Ramona could catch her breath, she was slammed down, eight massive golden claws caging her torso to the ground. She screamed again, a long wailing sound that echoed around the chamber. Tears were streaming freely now, making trails in the sand and dust that had settled across her cheeks. Oh, don't look so sad, Ramona. Your life finally has some actual meaning now, and your pathetic little existence will help fuel a new era in world history. When he's eaten enough, this bad boy will be able to break free of here. And once that happens, he'll be unstoppable, and I will be his master. And I, as his master, will of course reap the benefits. The demonic entity began pinching his claws together, effectively squeezing the air from Ramona's lungs. She tried to scream again, but... It came out as more of a gurgled cough. Between his natural armor and deadly appendages, Naja will bring back the glory days of the old gods. Besides, why keep killing off all the redneck Vermont house buyers for mere pennies, when I could make millions killing off the world? Frank was crouched under the porch in the backyard, his tail tucked between his legs, he had tried to warn his human that the suit man was outside in the dark, but she had ignored him and told him to get in the bed. He had led her downstairs to show her, but for some reason she had run right past him and gone down the bad-smelling stairs that were in the grass. His whimpers hadn't seemed to reach her, and each time she had called to him, he had wanted to go to her, but his fear was too great. Couldn't she hear the bad thing moving in the dark? Why hadn't his friend come back yet? His soft cries continued long into the night, as his heart filled with sadness, and he just wanted his human back.
In my house. We have one Ouija board in my dusty old attic, and we tend to get it out on Halloween for decoration purposes. We never really used it, and on the occasion that we did, we were all disappointed that we could never reach over and contact any spirit on the other side. I never really believed in ghosts or demons, and to me the world is a simple formula of biological organisms that live and then die. Then our dead bodies rot and decay till we're nothing but dust. I have a bleak view of the world. In the end we all turn to dust, and some creatures may last longer, like rats and maggots. But they too will all die. Death is such an interesting topic, and I'm not sure how long humans have lived on this planet, but death has always been something of a question mark. Even the most intelligent of humans couldn't even begin to answer on death's nature, philosophically speaking. Anyhow, it was on the day I had been left to look after my house while my wife took our kids to their grandparents. I don't tend to get the house all to myself, and when I was tidying the house up, I saw the Ouija board in my eldest boy's room, and he must have gotten it out secretly and started playing with it. I picked it up and just observed how stupid it looked. I decided to give it a go myself, and I used a glass cup which was going to act as my pointer on the Ouija board. I spoke out loud in the air, and still in my son's bedroom. All of his toys and childish interior started to have this menacing feel to it. Then I could feel heat coming from the glass cup, and it actually moved to a letter. It then moved to another letter, and the word read, Hello. I couldn't believe it, and I was just thinking whether I was being fooled or maybe my wife had set me up. Maybe she hadn't taken the kids to their grandparents, but organized this whole prank to be recorded and to be put up on YouTube. I got up and shouted, Very funny, guys. I know I'm being pranked again. But then I could easily tell that I wasn't being pranked. I mean, I may have been pranked before, and this did not feel like a prank. It felt real. I went back to the Ouija board with the glass cup in my hand and I started asking multiple questions like, How did you die? What time era did you come from? And the obvious question, What's the afterlife like? Then I could feel heat coming from the glass cup again, and it started to move. And the words it chose really confused me because of what it said when the words made a sentence, which read, We are not dead. And this was an unusual reply because the Ouija board is only used to contact the dead. Then the glass cup was moving on its own again and I was recording the letters on paper. The second sentence read, We have a much longer lifespan compared to you humans. At this point I was excited as well as completely dumbfounded, because the words you expect from Ouija board are things like death, hell, Satan, possession, and other religious supernatural terms. I then asked my replier, Why are you communicating with me? The glass cup got hotter, and the words it chose to tell me something really unnerved me. It read, We are studying you. I then asked why. The glass cup moved again, and the sentence read, So we can prepare to experiment on your kind. We come from another galaxy. At this point the glass cup was too hot to touch, and it broke into many pieces. The Ouija board itself burned up and I quickly put it out. Observing back on my first time experience using the Ouija board, it didn't feel like I was talking to anyone that was dead, or to some demon in another dimension. It felt like I was communicating with actual aliens, who had advanced technology. I guessed to myself that the reason why the glass heated up, as well as the Ouija board, must be because of the communication signal the aliens were using to communicate with me. I got another Ouija board, but nothing was happening, and I kept on trying to communicate with the aliens, but absolutely everything was silence. Then one day, I heard a thump noise coming from my son's room, and both me and my wife ran in. He wasn't in his room, but the Ouija board was present, and I could feel heat coming from it. We called the police and every other authority to help us find our son, but... 
Only I knew what must have really happened. As my wife swirled into depression, I secretly used the Ouija board to try and communicate with my son. I suspected that he had been abducted by the aliens when he decided to play around with it. I was grateful when the aliens finally communicated with me after a long time, and I asked them about my son. All they would reply to me on the Ouija board were the following words. Experiment on human boy complete. I had no idea what that meant. One day, I decided to call out to my boy to see if he was with the aliens. And it was the happiest day of my life when my boy finally communicated back with me through the Ouija board. I'm glad you're alive. What did they do to you? I shouted in the air in my son's room. The words he chose made every hair on my neck stand up. I'm replying to you from the afterlife. You see, my son did not survive whatever experiment the aliens did to him. Have you ever read personal accounts of people from the past who have experienced something traumatic? I'm sure you have. In history class, it seemed like all we did was read personal accounts or testimonies from people from World War I and World War II. Reading testimony or true accounts of traumatic events makes it easier for people in present times to understand what they went through, and to sympathize, I guess. I remember reading true accounts from old people who were evacuated to the farmlands during World War II. All I can say is that I'm glad I wasn't born in their time. In my attic, I found a box full of written personal past accounts going all the way back to when slavery was legal in America. What was strange about this box was how it just appeared in my attic, because my attic has always been empty and unused. The only reason I even went up in my attic was because I needed to find the holes in my roof where water was leaking through. The holes were also causing a draft. When I saw the box sitting there, I became curious. I soon found myself sitting there reading the paper testimonies I found inside. They were all titled, The Testimonies of Freedom. The first one I picked up was dated back to 1865 when Abraham Lincoln had abolished slavery in the US. The testimony was from a soldier who fought on the side of the North. Here is his testimony. We had won the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln had finally managed to abolish slavery. No man or woman or child should ever have to experience being a slave. I remember seeing slaves as a little boy. It used to torment my heart. The inhumane practices of slavery were disgusting. How men and women, those who should be our fellow brothers and sisters, were treated as property. It was ungodly. I remember traveling down a field on my way home to a new life after the war. It was strange. Slavery had ended, but I could see slaves working in this field. I stopped my horses and shouted out to them, You're no longer slaves. You're all free. There was an uncomfortable silence, and I could see some of them wanted to come with me, but the others stopped them and made them return to their work. They had no master. There was no one telling them what to do. There was no one making them slaves. Have they done this to themselves? I thought. I asked one of them what was going on. He told me that a great evil roams the land. It eats and survives on freedom, which has made them resort to remaining as slaves working the field. This evil wasn't human. But what kind of evil survives on someone's freedom? What kind of evil forces the victim to limit their own freedom to the point of slavery? I stayed on this field trying to help some of the slaves free themselves. As I did this, the scene around us began to change. We all started seeing deceased loved ones who had passed a long time ago. This wasn't an hallucination. We were all seeing the faces and bodies of our deceased friends and family members. But something about their appearances was off. Something was twisted and sinister. They asked us if we wanted freedom from everything. Some of the slaves accepted, and I saw with my own eyes what these resurrected loved ones were. They were the evil that roamed the land, that consumed freedom. They offered death as the ultimate freedom, because in death you are free from all debt, responsibility, and learning. 
I myself had been infected, and I joined the other slaves on the field doing slaves' work and limiting my freedom in every way to keep those creatures at bay. I couldn't believe what I had just read. It sounded so unbelievable. But the next testimony was even more extreme. It was from a World War II Allied Forces soldier who was trying to liberate people from concentration camps. It read, The Nazis were losing the war, and we were all trying our best to liberate the prisoners inside the concentration camps. I can't even begin to describe the horrendous conditions we witnessed when we entered. Disease. Torture. Famine. Most of the prisoners gladly came to us for aid during the rescue, but there were some who wouldn't leave the camps. They kept telling us that they needed to remain imprisoned inside, that their own freedom needed to remain limited. They also kept muttering, I have got to keep those creatures at bay, or they will take me. And at first I didn't understand it. They kept talking about some creature that fed off human freedom, and the only way to keep it from coming was by reducing one's own freedom. So in that sense, being a prisoner in a German concentration camp was perfect for keeping something like that away. But I didn't listen. I assumed their ramblings were simply a byproduct of the torture and starvation that they had endured. In the end, we pulled them out of the concentration camps and essentially forced them to be free. A few days after we had taken them to a medical facility to recover, those same people began to vanish. I don't know what to make of any of this, but every now and then, they appear to me. Only, something about their appearance is different. All they ever ask me is, if I want to be free from all of this. I do want to be free from all of this. Then the last one I read was the most disturbing. It was from a police officer who discovered a house used for human trafficking. The testimony read, There are days as a police officer my faith in humanity goes right out the window. It was the year 2000 and I had discovered a house that was being used for human trafficking. I was disgusted seeing all those male and female victims inside. How could any human being be so cruel? The most shocking part was the identity of their captors. The ones who had organized this diabolical project was their own parents, their relatives, their loved ones. They begged me to listen to them, that they would help me to understand why they had done this. They kept telling me that they had no choice but to make their children, siblings, and friends into victims of human trafficking, that their freedom needed to be limited as much as possible. They began talking about aliens, that they fed off of the freedom of humans, that this was the only way to save them. I called for backup and the house was raided within 30 minutes. All of the victims were taken to either hospitals or psychiatric clinics due to their fragile mental states. Even though every one of those victims was under 24-hour surveillance, they had all vanished without a trace sometime that night. The next morning, I found a box in my apartment that wasn't there before. I've lived alone since my wife divorced me, and she has our boy most of the time. This box was full of testimonies and personal accounts from people who have some experience dealing with these supposed creatures who survive off of human freedom. Not long after the box appeared, our son started seeing his grandparents. But they had been dead for five years. They kept asking him whether or not he wanted to be free. And when I saw my deceased parents somehow alive and trying to make my son accept their form of freedom, I immediately took him away from them. My wife didn't know what to do. They both came to live with me. I had to start limiting my son's freedom bit by bit to keep those creatures at bay. I now understood why the human trafficking house was made. I have no choice but to take my son's life and then my own. My wife can carry on living. I couldn't believe what I had just read. I have a feeling that these testimonies have been read before. It's like these creatures collect testimonies to give to present victims. 
It's like they're mocking me. Like they want me to know about them. And to know that they are coming for me. Right now, I can hear my daughter laughing at Bundy, our pet dog, rolling around in the garden. He died last year. It started. My friend and I always used to walk through a wonderful, spacious park when we were younger. It was full of tall trees, and it was very nicely maintained. In this large park, there was an abandoned mansion. I can't really say how long it had been there, but on that day, the front door of the mansion was wide open. The two of us decided to check out what was inside the place. As we inched through the door, the very first thing we noticed was that the mansion's floor was littered with crumpled up pieces of paper. We looked at each other and observed that there was no furniture, nothing except for those wrinkled balls of paper. The mansion had six rooms on its main floor, and every room we entered bore more and more scrunched up pieces of paper. We decided to open up one of the paper balls to see what was inside. Our curiosity got the better of us. I picked up a single wrinkled piece, and as my friend picked up another, I unfolded my paper, smoothing out its bends and dents. At that moment, it was almost as if a piece of rainbow emerged before our eyes, and I was suddenly standing next to a large window in one of the upstairs rooms of the house. I was looking outside into the large park. When I looked down at the piece of paper I held, it read, Look outside the large window that oversees the park in the upstairs parlor. I dropped the piece of paper and it fluttered gracefully to the ground. Meanwhile, I stared at my open hands in a bout of horror. Dazed and utterly perplexed, I found my way downstairs and met up with my friend. He was in the kitchen, sitting at a round table that hadn't been there before. Where did that come from? I wondered. My friend stared at his opened paper and reread the words several times before he looked at me and turned the page my way. It said, Go to the kitchen and sit at the round table. We stared at each other for a few moments, vaguely afraid, but then we began to chuckle. Within seconds we were laughing our heads off, marveling at our newfound game. We could hardly believe what had happened, but being young as we were, the mystery was endlessly exciting. We decided again to open another scrunched up piece of paper. As we opened up the crumpled papers on the floor, we experienced the same sudden flash of rainbow colors. But this time, I ended up lying in the field behind the mansion. When I peered onto the paper in my right hand, it read, Lie down in the field behind the mansion. I giggled uncontrollably. After a few minutes of running around the house, I found my friend collecting multiple balls of paper in his arms, eager to experience more of these strange, exciting phenomena. We both got the gist of what was happening at this point. We had no idea as to how it was possible, but we decided to have more fun with it. The supernatural always had a way of captivating our hearts. After a few more run-throughs with these strange mini teleportation devices, I began to feel apprehensive. I wondered if, at one point, I would be placed somewhere I didn't want to be, or I'd be made to do something that I didn't enjoy. We continued though. Minute after minute, we unfolded many papers and traveled through bedrooms, closets, trees. But then, after having been on the roof of the mansion, I had stood before my friend, dead on the living room floor. I didn't scream. I couldn't. Murder him. I read on the crumpled page as I felt a surge of vomit and bile rising into my throat. Nothing came out. 
but the sickness in my throat spread to my stomach, my head, and my heart. I didn't know what to do. At this point, I began to scream and shout, praying to God for this to be a nightmare. I wanted it to go away. I wanted to rewind our day and be outside again, together, walking underneath the trees. All I could do was hide his body in a cupboard. I willed myself to be calm, and I hesitantly unfolded another paper in hopes that the problem would correct itself. Once again, I saw the colors of the rainbow, and I found myself standing behind a tree several miles away from the house. Within a few instants, I could clearly see the front door. I saw both myself and my friend walk through that door. I began to wonder if I had died, or if I was having an out-of-body experience. I looked at the sheet in my hand, and the only words scrawled upon it were, Time will repeat itself, and a paradox will take place, and it will be allowed. That gave me an idea. In my pocket remained the paper that made me kill my friend. Without looking at it, I crumpled it back up. Quietly, I followed my other self, who had separated from my friend as he explored the rooms of the house. As I crept behind him, he turned around very suddenly. Before he could utter a syllable, I forced the paper in front of my eyes, and in a flash of rainbow colors, I was able to kill my other self. The laws of time allowed me to take over my dead self's place in this world, and also because of the fact that it was allowed to happen, as it was written on the second piece of paper that I had on me, which reversed time. It must have control over time and paradoxes, which made me now the new alive and present of my other dead self. I left my limp, bleeding other dead self in a cupboard in the upstairs bathroom to rot. To my great relief, I heard my friend call my name from downstairs. My friend, who managed to stay alive and well. My best friend. When I went downstairs, he greeted me excitedly, smiling childishly, and being blissfully unaware of the situation. I pretended that nothing had happened. In a heartbeat, I told him that the house creeped me out and that it would be much better if we left. After that day, we never went near the mansion again. I don't know if anyone saw or heard about anything that happened between us, but I recently heard from another friend that the house had been demolished. All I can tell you with great certainty is that while this news was a relief, I dreaded the probable prospect that my corpse was uncovered in the bathroom cabinet. My wife has been holding on to our son's Halloween costume for some odd reason. He isn't a child or anything. I mean, he's 20 years old. And I've been finding her behavior very confusing the last few days. She's been rather distant lately and I haven't had the courage to really go up and ask her why she's acting so strange. She's been rather irritable, but to be honest, our marriage had been going downhill the last couple of years. All marriages go a bit dim after a while, and after you have kids and you've spent a good portion of your life living with someone, you start finding it hard to even have a conversation. At least we haven't divorced. With my wife going through her weird mood swings, I've been feeling rather nostalgic. It could be the middle age thing, but I've been looking back at old pictures with me and my friends when we were younger. As Halloween draws nearer, she's been acting more erratic, another reason why I've been looking back at the past. I secretly kept every picture of me and my friends when we were all young men and we used to travel a lot. This was of course before we all got married and had kids. There was a picture of all of us on a beach in Thailand. If I remember correctly, it was our first time there, and it was a wonderful holiday. Blue skies, sunny days, clear water, and great food. I wish I could go back to those days. My favorite photo was when I asked a stranger to take a picture of all of us on the beach with our drinks in our hands. 
But when I was looking back at the picture, a sudden shock had hit me. The picture looked different. I'm not talking about aging because my friends and I have all clearly aged since then. But the background was different. I remember when the picture was being taken, it was absolutely amazing. Everything was perfect. The picture should have shown me and my friends on the beach with an amazing sun, blue skies, and the water calmly moving. It was now showing a storm, and my friends and I were all running off. I don't remember any storm happening in Thailand when we were on vacation. I remembered all of us enjoying our trip to Thailand, and whenever me and my friends would catch up occasionally at a restaurant, they'd all say positive things about it as well. Confused, I started phoning all of my friends that were on the vacation with me, and I told them how the picture that was taken with us on the beach had looked different. I was surprised when all of my friends who went on the trip to Thailand said what a terrible experience they had. How random weather and storms had brewed all over Thailand. None of this made sense because I didn't remember our holiday being like that. I hung up the phone and searched through the pictures again. I found another photo of me and my friends from a different trip we had taken. This trip came after Thailand and as I remembered, none of us enjoyed it. On this particular trip, we couldn't do much because storms and tornadoes had pretty much ruined our holiday. I even remembered taking pictures of the storms, but looking at the photographs now, it didn't show any storms. The photo appeared to show a delightful day, the type of day where the cold didn't bother anyone, and the snow was just amazing. When I spoke with my friends about the second holiday we took after Thailand, they were all saying just how much they loved it but I didn't remember it happening that way. I was starting to think there was something wrong with me. I went down to talk with my wife, but I could see she clearly wasn't in the mood to talk. She was hugging our son's Halloween costume. It was the one he had worn last Halloween to a costume party where he got really drunk. I had to pick him up and he puked all over my car. I tried taking our son's Halloween costume from her hands, but she fought back and told me to get away from her. I left the room and went back to search through more photos. This time I was looking back at old family photos. I sometimes miss when my children were babies. It was very hard being a father at first, and it did take some time to adjust. The first photo I looked at was when my son and daughter were just small children. It was a sunny day and both my kids were playing in the back garden. It was a happy moment for all of us, but something about the picture wasn't agreeing with my memory. The picture should have shown my two kids smiling at the camera, as well as my wife in the background holding up four lemonades. At least that was how I had remembered it. But the picture showed both of my kids running off, because a snowstorm had brewed in the middle of summer, and snow could be seen. I don't remember that day being like that, for me, it was just a perfect happy day. I went into my daughter's room to talk to her about the picture and ask her what she remembered about that day. But when she looked at her older brother in the photograph as a child, she started crying. I didn't really understand what she was crying about because their relationship had always been very civil. I asked my daughter about that day and she said she remembered a random strange cold storm brewing over the hot summer day but my memory of it was somehow different. I went back to talk to my wife. She was just staring at nothing and still holding on to our son's Halloween costume. She slowly let go of the costume and looked at the picture I showed her of the cold storm brewing on the hot summer day, with both our kids in the picture running off before the snow touched them. She smiled a little, focusing mainly on the image of our son as a child. When I calmly asked her what she remembered about that day, her response exactly matched what my daughter had said. But I was honest with her about how I had remembered that day. I told her that I had remembered it being an amazing summer day, where both of our kids played in the small-sized pool, burgers being cooked on the barbecue, and my wife's amazing fresh lemonade. She hugged me and gave me back the picture, and then went right back to holding our son's Halloween costume. I decided to go back up to my room and finish reading a book I had just started. But when I got into my room, the book wasn't there. 
in its place was the sequel, and not the first version. I went back to the library to give back the sequel version for the original one, but the library told me that I had already read the first version, and that I had already returned that book and checked out the second book. I told her that was impossible, but then she showed me the CCTV footage of me giving back the first book, and trading it in for the second one. I didn't even remember finishing the first book. I felt extremely off, and I considered going to the doctor, but I didn't feel ill, at least not ill enough to see a doctor anyway. And besides, doctors these days don't have the patience to deal with people who think or feel they might have something wrong with them. I couldn't stop thinking about the pictures and why everyone had remembered them so differently. That night I was struggling to sleep. I kept on feeling like an idiot for returning a book I hadn't even read yet, but I didn't remember doing anything like that. But it was those old photographs that were worrying me the most. I went online to see if I could find someone else who had been maybe experiencing the same things I had. One thing I love about the internet is how it's made the world more connected, and maybe I could find someone on the other side of the world who had been dealing with the same problem. That feeling of being alone is the worst feeling ever. The downside of the internet being that it's so large, you'll have many people who consider themselves to be experts, and it makes it hard to distinguish between who is correct and who's just talking absolute crap. I couldn't find much on what I was experiencing, but periodically I would find myself deep into a conversation on some forum which I didn't remember reading. I was also having trouble remembering why I had started reading. I could also hear my wife arguing in the background with my daughter about what we were going to be doing on Halloween as a family. Halloween was always our most loved celebration. We even preferred it over Christmas. But I could hear my wife saying that she was against celebrating Halloween this year for some odd reason. I kept on with my internet search trying to find someone else experiencing the same symptoms I was, and whether this was something I really needed to go see a doctor for. I was starting to think I was exhibiting symptoms of dementia, or maybe Parkinson's disease. But then another thought came to me. When I was looking back at the pictures, the thing that was different in them was never the people, but the weather. I changed my search on the internet from memory problems and illness, to changes in backgrounds and photographs, but after an exhaustive search I couldn't find anything. I started searching through global warming forums and other weather-related forums to find people who may have had the same experience as I had had with weather changing in photographs. During my search, I could hear my wife downstairs trashing the Halloween costumes and decorations. I had to go down and physically restrain her because she was going nuts. I shouted at her to explain what was going on and what she thought she was doing, and she just shouted back at me asking me how I could possibly be so calm and not show any emotion like she had been showing. I had no idea what she was going on about. I went to sleep on the couch. When I got up, I saw that I had received a reply in one of the forums I had posted in. It was from a professor who had taught at a university. He had done studies on weather and geography, as well as global warming. I don't really want to go into detail about exactly who he is, but I was glad I managed to get a reply from someone as educated as him. I was able to meet with him in his office a couple of days later, and he told me that he himself had been experiencing the exact same symptoms I had been experiencing. He was straight with me about his explanation about what we were both experiencing, but it sounded completely absurd. He had been drinking a bit, but his mind still seemed sharp. And to be honest, even though I don't drink, during the conversation I started to feel like I could use one myself. As I sat and talked with the professor, I started thinking about what simple times they used to be back in the old days, and I realized that the wisdom my generation had been given was now completely useless. Trying to explain it in the most logical way that he could, the professor told me that the global weather of the 21st century was changing so rapidly that it was not only impacting the global weather of the future, but it was also affecting the global weather of the past. This would explain why the weather in the background of the photos looked differently than how I had remembered. He handed me a book-sized stack of papers, 
It was an unpublished article he had written about the strange effects of 21st century global warming. By the time I read to part 20, I couldn't even remember reading parts 1 through 19. Apparently I was sitting in his office for hours and hours just reading the article, but it only felt like I had been sitting there for less than an hour. These strange conflicting memories were caused by changes in the weather. Apparently, 99% of the world population won't even notice, but somehow, that small 1% like the professor and myself do notice, and we're aware of the changes. If the weather changes were now affecting the past, it meant that these changes were also affecting the future. It was a lot to take in. I went back home and my wife was still trashing the Halloween decorations, as well as our son's costume. I asked her why she was acting this way, and she asked me the same thing. She asked me about the Halloween party our son went to last year, and I explained to her how he had gotten drunk and puked all over my car. But it was a great night though. Great night? Are you kidding me right now? This is not something you joke about, she shouted at me. She told me that last Halloween, a terrible random storm had come over. There was flooding, snow, and even a tornado that wrecked a lot of people's homes and ruined their way of life. Our son was caught in the storm and died, and I had apparently found his body. But I didn't remember any of that happening. She even told me where his body was buried. I didn't believe her, so I went to check the cemetery. And it was true. I now understood why my wife was acting so strange, and why she couldn't let go of our son's Halloween costume. If you can't remember a random storm occurring last Halloween, well, maybe that's because the past has been changed again. Within the last couple of months, my computer mouse hadn't been working properly on my computer, and I had tried using multiple computer mouses. It was irritating, and I really needed my computer to do my job when I was not in the office. I'm one of those guys who brought his work life home. It was destroying my marriage and even my relationship with my child, but at least the bills got paid. I changed the computer itself, and still the computer mouse never worked for any kind of computer I got. Even though this sounds like a small problem, it was really starting to get to me. It's the small things that cause the biggest bumps in life. Like when you lose your car keys so you can't drive your car. Or when you forget a password and you can't log into something that you desperately need to. These small problems cause the greatest pain. We had a pet mouse. One day my son comes crying to me telling me that his pet mouse had died. I was just too busy worrying about the computer and the broken computer mouse to absorb whatever my son was telling me. I was that clueless that I just casually put the dead mouse on my desktop, and my son just went out of the room feeling satisfied that I would deal with it. When I realized that I had a dead mouse on my desk, I was a little disgusted, but I noticed that the pointer on the computer screen was now moving slightly. I tried moving the computer mouse, but nothing happened. But when I moved the dead mouse on my desk, the pointer on my computer screen started working. I could click on things again. It was a miracle. I could do some work at home now, and even though it was weird and just illogical that I was using a dead mouse as a computer mouse, it was better than nothing. When the dead mouse started to turn to bones, it started to lose its effect on the computer. I tried getting a proper computer mouse, but it didn't work. I tried changing the computer again, but I became angry when the new computer failed to work. Something was off, and I didn't have time to investigate properly. So I got another pet mouse from the pet shop, and killed it straight away when I got home. To my delight, the dead mouse worked way better as a computer mouse than the last and I managed to keep its body from rotting by keeping it in the fridge. I just needed to get stuff done for my job when I was at home. And when you need to get stuff done, you do whatever you have to do to keep everything balanced. If I had lost my job, then everything around me would have crumbled. I started to notice that every time I used a real dead mouse as a computer mouse, 
my need for the computer kept on growing. Like, I would get urgent calls from work ordering me to get something done. Otherwise, I would be in trouble and my job would be on the line. If the electrical computer mouse failed to work, I would start having the worst thoughts running through my head. Then, without even thinking, I would just find any small animal and then kill it to use it as a replacement computer mouse to get my work done. I did start to get worried about how I was becoming too comfortable using small dead animals in times of desperation as a replacement. I mean, how can a small innocent animal be able to be used as a computer mouse? They're not even electrical. I remember once I woke up to a phone call from my boss shouting at me for forgetting to do something at work, and I needed to get it done from home. You see, my job deals with insurance and we have major deals with many large companies. I quickly got up, and somehow, I had a dead animal in my hand as well as a bloody knife. I couldn't even remember killing it. It was a small mouse. I went down into my computer room in my house to work. When I was finishing up the task, I could hear my son crying. After completing what needed to be done on the computer, I was now back to earth and my son's crying was really loud and quite troublesome. The dead mouse in my hand didn't feel like a rat, and I could feel its skin easily come off. As I took off the dead mouse's skin, I realized it wasn't skin but a cloth-like material, like a costume. Under the costume was a small boy's hand, I remembered my little boy was going to a costume party dressed as a mouse, and his costume had mouse-shaped hands that went with the rest of the outfit. I realized what I had done. That moment woke me up and shook me to my core. My son's crying was only getting louder, and I could hear the ambulance and police sirens as they approached my house. And then, all of a sudden, The normal electrical computer mouse started to work again. <laughs>